You're watching BBC News at nine with me, Carrie Gracie. The headlines. He's got it! England have won the World Cup! English cricket celebrates an astonishing victory in the World Cup final at Lords. They lifted the trophy after beating New Zealand with the final ball of the tournament. We did it! We oh, did Joff it! Delivered. And we were brilliant! Joffre delivered! Joffre delivered! He's a England, boy. world He's champion! A boy. Other news, the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt will launch a fresh bid to stop the Iran nuclear deal unravelling at an EU meeting this morning. A sharp rebuke for President Trump, he's accused of racism after tweeting that four congresswomen should go back to where they came from. New figures from the Mayor of London show what he says is a clear link between poverty in the capital and rising youth crime. It wasn't all the cricket, it went down to the wire at Wimbledon. Novak Djokovic makes history after beating Roger Federer in a final set tie-break. Good morning, welcome to BBC News at nine. England's men's cricket team will this morning celebrate winning the Men's Cricket World Cup for the first time after an extraordinary finish to a tense final at Lords. The main match ended in a tie, which meant the game went to a super over to decide the winner. And that went down to the very last ball, a run out, another tie, and England winning on the number of boundaries they'd scored. Here's our sports correspondent, John Watson. England's men, world champions for the very first time, proving it on the biggest stage by the tightest of margins. After seven weeks of compelling cricket, who would have predicted this? Oh, no. But well, we did it. We oh, did Joffre it. Delivered. And we were brilliant. Joffre delivered. Joffre delivered. He's a England, boy. world He's champion. A boy. Yeah. Have you ever seen a game that tight? Nah. England! England not, made not. a history today. No. England made a history today. Welcome home. That is the greatest cricket one day cricket ever match of all time. To win it, England needed 15 runs from the final six balls. Step forward, Ben Stokes. After smashing a six, a lucky break. Having run two, this throw caught his bat, and England had four more. Two needed then for World Cup glory. One short, the scores were tied. A super over would settle it. The penalty shootout of cricket, six balls each. Back came Butler and Ben Stokes as England made 15. Now, New Zealand's turn. Needing two to win, a desperate dash. And a historic end to this contest. By virtue of having scored more boundaries throughout the match, the win was England's. Everyone went in the direction of Joss Butler trying to catch. It, to me and to the team, and everybody who's been involved over the last four years, it, it means absolutely everything. Uh, and the planning, the hard work, the dedication. After such tension, time to cool off, just as these fans did watching in Trafalgar Square. England World Cup winners. It was still sinking in at Lords. A magical match, a fitting finale. England, World Cup winners. John Watson, BBC News. Well, you won't be surprised. There's been a lot of reaction on Twitter to all of this. The Queen sent her warmest congratulations to the team after that thrilling victory. She also sent commiserations to the runners-up New Zealand. She said they'd competed so admirably throughout the tournament. Leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, congratulated every member of the England team. He said the game shows what you can achieve with a slice of luck and when you never give up. Mr Corbyn also commented on why it should be free to watch on TV. And the Prime Minister, Theresa May, who was at Lords, posted well done at England cricket. She even included a gif of her and her husband, Philip, doing that celebratory dance that we're all familiar with to mark a special occasion. Well, on the other side of the world in New Zealand, less dancing. The newspapers were being printed just as the match was starting. So the job of covering the drama fell to websites, TV and radio and social media. The front page of New Zealand Herald's website hailed the nation as the world's best losers. But their sports pages told a different story of heartbreak at such a close outcome. 
Meanwhile, the New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, posted on Instagram to congratulate England, joking about how, as a nation, we all aged a year in that super over. Well, our sports correspondent, John Watson, at Lords this morning. John, did you age a year? I think so. I think my heart rate has only just come down now, Carrie. Yes, I don't think anyone in a million years would have envisaged what we witnessed here yesterday. Quite dramatic scenes to think that this match was tied not once, but twice. The two teams couldn't be split after 50 overs each, and still they couldn't be split after that super over as they faced six balls each. As we heard there, England winning by virtue of having scored more boundaries, more sixes, more fours throughout the match than New Zealand did. They're 26 to New Zealand's 17. Um, as we know, this is what England have really been working towards after going out at the first round of the last World Cup four years ago. This was the priority to win the World Cup. And it, it prompted a change in the way that England have played. Of course, we saw Andrew Strauss come, as, come in as director of cricket. He prioritised white ball cricket. We saw Trevor Bayliss appointed as head coach, a specialist in the shorter formats of the game. And it certainly benefited England. And interesting to note that they stuck by Owen Morgan, who was a member of that team that went out in the first round four years ago, of course, captaining the side now. And who would have thought... I'm sure he didn't think that he would be here uh, having uh, led England to a World Cup, having been brought up, what, on the outskirts of, uh, of Dublin. But he's really masterminded this attacking cricket that England have played, that England have demonstrated over this four-year period. And it's worth pointing out that it is that that got them over the line, of course, by virtue of having hit as many sixes and as many fours as they did in the match. Um, huge disappointment, of course, for New Zealand. Beaten finalists yesterday, as they were in Melbourne four years ago. A real sickener for them. But I think going forward, England will hope that this will inspire the next generation of cricketers. A lot, of course, has been made by the fact that this match was on free-to-air television for the first time in 14 years. And there haven't been many I was there moments for cricket, of course, not since the Ashes back in 2005. But they will hope that families, the country over, will have been gathered around the TV uh, yesterday to watch the events uh, that unfolded. And, of course, England will also hope that this will prove a, a huge boost in what is a very busy summer of cricket, Carrie, with the Ashes just around the corner. It gets underway at Edgebaston uh, on the 1st of August. And having won the World Cup, who knows now what England can produce uh, when that Test Series gets underway. John, thanks so much for that. Now, I want to take up that question that John was raising about participation um, with Tim because it's a brilliant achievement for the national team. But what does it mean for the future of the sport, participation, momentum among young people? Tim, take it away. Yeah, good morning to you. Well, this school in southwest London, they're having a cricket-themed day in celebration of the World Cup victory. Uh, Chance to Shine is a charity which runs cricket in state schools and the hope is that it will inspire young people to carry cricket through into their adult lives. Guys, quickly, did you watch the match yesterday? Yeah! Are you glad England won? Yes! Yeah! Cool. Just checking. Adam, you're from Chance to Shine. You're from the charity which runs this event. How big a deal is this victory? Oh, it's a massive moment for the sport. You know, 1966, 2003, 2019. It's huge for cricket. And we, as Chance to Shine, we're going to work to really capture this moment, capture the enthusiasm of the children that you hear, uh, you see here today and make sure that, that kids can really get that opportunity to play cricket. You know, we work with around half a million children every year, many of whom have never had a chance to play the sport before. So we think it's so important that we can give them that opportunity to play it, capture that enthusiasm, that excitement that they saw yesterday and really enjoy playing the, playing the sport. Adam, thanks so much indeed. Let's have a quick chat to some of them. Could interrupt your game if I may. How exciting was it to watch the match yesterday? I found it really exciting and it was amazing. Is it going to inspire you to play cricket more and more as you get older? Yeah, definitely because we're making friends and all that and it's just so competitive. I love it. How tense was it when you watched the end of the match? Oh my god, like the one point that let them win it's just an inspirational game it's made me on to be a better cricketer and always dream on to do cricket some skills on display this morning are mightily impressive you guys have been doing very well thanks as much indeed you might recognize this former cricketer here gladstone small no less former england player you were on the world cup squad weren't you back in the day how important is it that england won and that kids take that and play cricket in the future uh, 
terrifically important, not just for the whole, the players obviously yesterday, as youngsters, they would have they would have probably grown up watching me lose a, a World Cup final, and they've gone one better, which is great, great to see. I wasn't going to bring that up, but you know. <laughs> it's great It's great to see. And you know, just here this morning with these youngsters, and they're very keen, they're, and they're good, they're talented. And it's good, it's good for them to, to see that, and to see that, yes, you can be successful, uh, but, but more importantly, you can get involved, and that's what Chats to Chats are saying do at schools all throughout the country during this whole World Cup. They've, they've visited over almost a million school school children to to give them a taste of what it's like to be involved and sportsmanship, togetherness, m making friends. I mean, I, I finished playing 20 years ago, and I've still got still got friends in, in the game. And it was good to see yesterday. I was was watching the game with, with mates, and they're, and they're not big cricket fans per se, but they just they just they just love. They just want to be involved, and that was what it's that's what it's about. So it's good to see. It was a collective experience, Gladstone. Thank you so much indeed. And again, I've seen you joining in today. What a brilliant thing for the kids to have a former international such as yourself they're here. Show, Can you me things that demonstrate I, some no, skills here for us? Yeah, it's too low for me to get. Oh, it's too low. Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Kids here, hopefully some future stars. Certainly inspired by what they saw. Certainly gripped by what they saw. But hey, won't be all. Thanks, Tim. Now moving on, because European Union and foreign ministers are gathering in Brussels today to consider how to stop the international nuclear deal with Iran from unravelling amid heightened tensions in the Gulf. In a statement published yesterday evening, the UK, France and Germany have made a joint appeal to President Trump and to Iran's leaders to ease their standoff over Iran's nuclear programme. They said the deal reached with Iran could unravel further and everyone involved should consider the consequences of their actions. Well, in that statement, uh, Prime Minister Theresa May, French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Angela Merkel say... We believe the time has come to act responsibly and seek a path to stop the escalation of tensions and resume dialogue. It goes on to say the risks are such that it is necessary for all stakeholders to pause and consider the pos possible consequences of their actions. Well, this morning, Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt said the deal could still be saved as he arrived in Brussels to meet his EU counterparts. Well, it isn't dead yet, and uh, we are totally committed to keeping the Middle East denuclearized. If, if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, then other countries in the region will acquire nuclear weapons. It becomes a very, very toxic and dangerous situation. So we are looking to find a way to preserve the nuclear deal, which we think is the best way of keeping the Middle East as a whole nuclear weapon free. Uh, Iran is still a good year away from developing a nuclear weapon. We think there is still some closing but small window to keep the deal alive and that's what I'm here to talk about. The Foreign Secretary and we'll catch up uh, with events in Brussels as the morning progresses. Now moving on because President Donald Trump has been accused of racism after suggesting a group of ethnic minority congresswomen should go back to where they came from. In a series of tweets the President said they should fix what he called the catastrophic governments in their countries of origin instead of criticizing the US. Three of the congresswomen in question were born in the United States while another came to the country as a young child. Well, let's see what the US president actually said. He began, so interesting to see progressive Democrat congresswomen who originally came from countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt and inept anywhere in the world, if they even have a functioning government at all, now loudly and viciously telling the people of the United States, the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, how our government is to be run. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came? then come back and show us how it is done. These places need your help badly. You can't leave fast enough. I'm sure that Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat House Speaker, would be very happy to quickly work out free travel arrangements. So that is the message from President Trump, and that story will no doubt develop later in the morning as the US gets up. China has recorded its worst quarterly growth figures in nearly 30 years. As the trade war with the United States continues, the economy in China grew 6.2% in the last quarter, compared with the same time last year. 
Well, our economics correspondent, Darshini David, is here with more. Darshini, how much is this due to the kind of long-term slow slowdown of Chinese economy? And how much is it due to the trade war? Well, absolutely, Carrie. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? 6.2%. Any other country, probably well, most other countries, would be shouting about that kind of figure. They wouldn't be able to expect anything like that. But as you know full well, this is pretty weak compared to what we've seen in China in recent years. And as you say, part of it is down to design because the Chinese government has this long-term economic plan, become less dependent on selling to the rest of the world, become more dependent on growing your own consumer power, growing your own domestic demand. So that's that going on in the background. And because of that, we always expect there to be a moderation from those heady paces of growth. But also there is that trade war and that is starting to inflict pain on Chinese exporters and also damage the amount of imports coming in as well. So but it's interesting, though, how much pain is it actually inflicting? Because obviously President mm. Trump has been kind of gloating from the other side of the world saying, oh, Chinese economy not so great look at ours so great but actually you know in a way if you were president trump wouldn't you want to see more slowdown than this to be able to say you really we're would. making the pipsqueak you really would because at the moment that pain isn't coming through in the way that perhaps president trump envisaged he said oh look at our companies they're able to buy from elsewhere they're not going to depend on chinese producers Actually, that doesn't seem to be happening. If you look at the American economy, what's happening is American companies are still buying from China and passing on those higher prices to consumers. So it's American consumers who are paying the price. Chinese manufacturers still doing pretty well, which is why the slowdown perhaps hasn't been more severe. But can we carry on like this? This is the question we have to ask, of course. And the answer is no, because the pain will intensify in the coming months. Already there are economists out there saying, the Chinese government might have to do more, try and stimulate demand a bit more at the domestic end, cut interest rates. It doesn't want to do that because of debt levels. And I suppose as, as well, the other perspective that we should kind of get into the mix here is that of anyone who wants to sell into China, mm. whether raw materials or yes. their export. It's like Chinese growth matters to people so much more than it used to. It really does. I mean, we always think of China sort of selling more to the rest of the world, right? Uh, but it's a two-way process. China's actually becoming less dependent on selling to the rest of the world. It's becoming more dependent, or rather our countries are becoming more dependent on selling to China. And because supply chains are so complex as well, then yes, it really does matter to all of us what's going on in China. We used to say that thing, didn't we, all the time about America sneezing and we catching a cold. Well, actually, we could say the same thing about China now. Ignore at our peril. I think. Okay, well, let's turn away from the giants and come back to UK Sports Direct story. Sports this Direct, yes. This is a really intriguing one. Mike Ashley, do you remember, he mm. uh, snapped up House of Fraser last summer, told us that he was going to be the saviour of the high street, create the Harrods of the high street doesn't seem to have gone that way. Uh, meant to bring out results uh, later on this week, now saying they're going to have to delay them by a month or even more than that. Why part of it is due to the complexity of integrating House of Fraser, also concerns about trading uh, there, both now and in the future as well. Rumour has it it's losing millions of pounds per week. It's not just down to the retail environment. Investors are beginning to worry about Mr Ashley and his spending spree because he's been buying companies from Evans the Cycling Company to Sofa.com. Has it all gone slightly sour and pear-shaped? Well, investors will have to wait a bit longer to find out. Mm, concerning. Thanks, Darshini. Mm. Let's take a look at our headlines on BBC News. English cricket celebrates an astonishing victory in the World Cup final at Lords. Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt will launch a fresh bid to stop the Iran nuclear deal unravelling at an EU meeting in Brussels. A sharp rebuke for President Trump. He's accused of racism after tweeting that four congresswomen should go back to where they came from. And in sport, England are cricket world champions. They beat New Zealand in the most dramatic of circumstances at Lords to secure their first World Cup. Novak Djokovic has his 16th Grand Slam title after winning Wimbledon for the second year in a row. He beat Roger Federer in a thrilling men's final, the longest in Wimbledon history. And Lewis Hamilton won an historic sixth British Grand Prix at Silverstone. He held off the challenge of his Mercedes teammate Valtteri Bottas and remains top of the Drivers' Championship. An incredible weekend of sport. More on all those stories in about 20 minutes' time. See you then. The Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, is launching a series of projects designed to protect children from knife crime during the summer holidays. He says a major new study into youth crime shows there's a clear link between poverty and serious violence. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Dominic Kashiani. Full of fighting spirit, for all the right reasons. One, two, three, 
Some of the 320 children coached by South London's Dwayne Namix Boxing Club. 15 trainers give their time for free, teaching children discipline, self-confidence and how to stay away from crime in one of the poorest parts of London. One, two, well done. One, two. Joshua Simpson's jab is the measure of success. On the verge of a criminal life, police took him to the club for mentoring and he's now a 16-year-old champion. People that are there that's trying to get out and then there's people that, that are there but like they like to be in there. Like, now I can see like loads of different routes to a way where I can pick which route I feel is best. Like, it's just that like, everything's open now. The club is a tribute to Joshua's cousin, Dwayne Simpson, stabbed to death five years ago while protecting a friend. But we're dealing with young children that are frightened. They are stressed. They're going through trauma because this youth violence has now got so out of control. London's Mayor Sadiq Khan says he's worried what will happen when the schools break up for summer. And what this research shows that in 75% of the boroughs where there's the highest violent crime, these are in the top 10 boroughs with the most poverty, the most deprivation, the biggest concerns around mental health, the biggest school exclusion. Youth leaders, including the Dwayne Namix team, will be in Downing Street today to share their experiences. The government has put an extra £100 million into the police this year, and it plans a legal duty for schools and other public bodies to work together to combat youth violence. Dominic Kashani, BBC News. Around 2 million low-paid workers could receive statutory sick pay for the first time as part of proposed reforms. The government says the plans aim to support people with health conditions in the workplace. Currently, employees must earn at least the equivalent of 14 hours a week on the minimum wage to qualify. Police in England and Wales are targeting airports as part of a crackdown on forced marriage. Campaigners say victims are more likely to be taken overseas during the summer holidays. Police will be assisted by charities and social workers as they teach airport staff how to spot the signs. The government was too slow to respond to mob protests outside primary schools in Birmingham, triggered by lessons that include LGBT plus topics. That's according to the woman tasked with challenging extremism. In an exclusive interview with BBC Panorama, Sarah Khan says the Department for Education should have done more to support head teachers. The government says it's been clear from the outset. Simit Katecha has this report. Kids. Be kids. Head teacher. Protesters outside schools in Birmingham have been campaigning against the use of storybooks featuring same-sex couples, part of programmes teaching about equality. Most pupils at the schools are Muslim. The protesters say their religion doesn't accept homosexuality. She comes home and says, why do I have two mummies, why do I have two daddies? How are you meant to explain that? Small children like that, they're brainwashing them, confusing them. Now the lead commissioner for countering extremism, Sarah Khan, has described what she's seen in Birmingham as a mob who are chanting and shouting and engaging in intimidating behaviour. She's accused the government of being too slow to act. The DfE could have done so much more. I think they were too slow to respond and to be able to provide support to head teachers who are experiencing something that's really quite traumatic, but also clarifying what's actually being taught to, to pupils in, in school. In 2020, the government wants all schools to teach LGBT content as part of new compulsory relationship and sex education. The guidance was changed because the world has changed. We want children to grow up understanding that some people are different, some relationships are different from what they may have experienced, but all are valuable. Sarah Khan says she's now concerned what might happen next. I'm worried that how, when RSE comes um, formally into the curriculum in, in 2020, that this will escalate even further. Panorama has spoken to other religious groups around the country who are looking to build campaigns of their own. Seema Katecha. BBC News. Well, that panorama sex education, the LGBT debate in schools is shown on BBC One this evening at 8.30. Tear gas has been fired at protesters on the Champs-Élysées in Paris following the annual Bastille Day military parade. Demonstrators dragged security barriers into the road and set fire to bins. Police said they detained more than 150 people, including two Yellow Vest leaders accused of staging an unauthorised demonstration. 
A study that followed nearly 200,000 people over eight years has found that diet and exercise can help almost everyone lower their risk of dementia. Researchers found that even those with a higher risk of developing the disease could lower it by up to a third through adopting a healthier lifestyle. Here's our health and science correspondent, James Gallagher. Sue Taylor is committed to keeping fit. She comes here for a workout three times a week, as well as watching what she eats. Her mother and grandmother both had dementia, and she doesn't want the same to happen to her. I just want to keep mentally, um, keep my brain as sharp as possible for as long as possible. And I feel that if I don't get out, be active, then I'm not probably doing myself any favours. So what does it take to avoid dementia? You can live the life of a saint and still get dementia. But this study shows you can alter your risk. Now, the healthiest people in this study, they were exercising vigorously for more than 75 minutes a week. They didn't smoke. They drank alcohol only in moderation. And they had a healthy, balanced diet. So how big a difference did it make? The study followed people for eight years. Less than 1% of them developed dementia as they were so young. But having a healthy lifestyle cut the risk by a third. I think it's really important that what we've shown is that even if you've got a high genetic risk of dementia, if you engage in high, healthy lifestyle, you could substantially reduce your own risk of dementia. I think that potential is absolutely critical. There are still no treatments for dementia, but the researchers say knowing lifestyle changes okay, could prevent some cases is exciting and empowering. James Gallagher, BBC News. Last year, the internet went to meltdown when Disney released a surprise trailer for its live-action remake of The Lion King. Now, the wait is over. The stars of the movie, including Donald Glover and Beyonce, were at the premiere in London last night, along with the Duke of du and Duchess of Sussex and our lucky entertainment correspondent, Lisa Zimba. The Duke and Duchess chatting to some of the hundreds of fans who'd gathered in Leicester Square for the premiere. Then it was time for real life royalty to meet showbiz royalty, led by Beyonce, who voices a character in the film, and her husband, Jay-Z. As well as other members of the cast and the team behind the movie. Even though some of the reviews have been less than spectacular, there's still a huge amount of anticipation for the film because the original Lion King is particularly loved by audiences who went to see it in such numbers, it became Disney's biggest film of the 20th century. Everything you see exists together in a delicate balance. This time around, the story's been brought to life using computer-generated characters and backgrounds but has kept the familiar characters from the original, including the comedic pair Timon and Pumba. Let me see what we're dealing with here. It's a lion! Run for your life, Pumba! Wait, 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 wait. It's, it's a little lion! It gets bigger! And me and Billy Eichner, who plays Timon, did all of our recording together, which was a rare opportunity, and I think you can really tell. We were able to improvise and, and really respond to one another in real time, and I think uh, it gives uh, our stuff like an incredibly like naturalistic feel, which is which is awesome. Run away, Simba, and never return. Because of the affection so many have for the story, along with the massive box office of the original, the head of Disney, currently Hollywood's most successful studio, knows there's a lot riding on getting the movie just right. So this is what I would call one of our crown jewels, one of the most beloved films, one of the most successful, one of the most enduring, and yes. I think there's a lot of pressure on this, but we feel great about the movie that John Favreau and the team made. You have a lot of fans that you want to you don't want to let them down, especially the ones who grew up watching the uh, animated film. You have your cast, you got Disney, you got the new the new audience. So there's a lot to balance out to get this right. But I'm uh, very happy with uh, how hard everybody worked and and the wonderful interpretations the new people brought to the roles and to the songs. Disney have had a lot of success in recent years updating animated classics like Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin for the 21st century. They'll be hoping that The Lion King will continue that winning streak. Lisa Mazimba, BBC News, Leicester Square. Yeah, that coming to a cinema near you. Now, in a moment, the weather. First, though, here's Victoria with what she's coming up, got coming up in her programme at 10. 
Good morning. As you know, England's men are cricket world champions for the first time ever after one of the most extraordinary finals ever. This was the scene of fans celebrating in Trafalgar Square in London last night. We've loads of reactions throughout the programme, including from former England players Monty Palisar and Mike Gatting and from fans. Join us live. 10 o'clock, BBC Two, the BBC News Channel and online. Oh, Victoria, we can't have any raining on that parade, can we, Matt? Oh, we can't. No, definitely not. And you weren't today anyway, because it's another dry day for much of the UK since Swithin's Day, in fact. And legend has it, if it's dry today, it'll be dry for the next 40 days. Uh, we live in the UK. It's not going to happen, is it really? Because by the end of the week, we're all going to see some wet and windy weather, which I'm just sure will be welcome news to some gardeners, particularly across the south. But out there today, it said most will be dry. Quite a bit of cloud through the Midlands and eastern England at the moment. Staying fairly grey this morning, brightening up into the afternoon. Elsewhere, long sunny spells, light winds. On the uh, tops of the moors of southwest England, the Welsh mountains, Cumbrian fells, outside chance of a shower later in the day, but the vast majority stay dry. Warmest in the west, temperatures 23 or 24 degrees, a bit cooler down the east. Still a northerly breeze, which eases through tonight, and with clearer skies overnight, it's here where we'll see temperatures dip back into single figures. Milder night elsewhere, particularly in the west, as a southwesterly wind starts to develop bringing more cloud to Scotland and Northern Ireland for tomorrow. So there will be a bit more cloud tomorrow, particularly across northern and western areas. A few showers here and there. Many will be dry and warmer towards the south and east. More in half now. Wherever you are, follow the story. Get BBC News straight to your inbox. Subscribe at bbc.co.uk forward slash news daily. And if you're on the go, you can still watch the BBC News channel live in the app. Follow the story, wherever you are. How can reading fiction be good for our mental health? I'm Hepzibah Anderson, and I'm at the Hay Festival, where I'll be joined by best-selling author Jessie Burton, award-winning writer Alex Wheatle, and bibliotherapist Ella Bertu. Culture at the Hay Festival 2019, Saturday at 8.30 on the BBC News Channel.